Hello, welcome to Truck Stop Murder and True Crime Podcast. I am your host, Gary Howard. How's everybody doing today? Hopefully you're all enjoying my Monday episodes that I start putting out again. I have two out so far. I got Gary Gilmore and John Sprinklink. So hopefully i continue to be doing them on Mondays and these on Wednesdays. And well, that one came out on Tuesday because of Memorial Day weekend. I don't want to flood the remembrance of Memorial Day on murder, of murder. So I waited then put out Tuesday. So hopefully by next Monday, I'll have the, the following. The third, I'm going to go in order of the death penalty inmates from 76. Once they started re readmitted the death penalty, capital murder, until now. We have a lot to do. Once the blue moon, I might change it to whoever is being executed at the time, like I did a couple weeks ago. And so, And this episode will have a truck stop. That won't have a truck stop. I think I'm going to try to do something coming up. I already got it recorded. I got the approval from my boss or my wife, I guess you could say. She said, go ahead and release it. It seems like a good idea. So that'll be out. I already got it recorded. So I'm going to have that scheduled for release on Friday. But anyhow, this is a true crime podcast about me, a truck driver. Works. I work for Prima Express. I travel all over the, well, I used to travel all over the 48 states. They kind of restricted our loads. So, but I have traveled all over 48 states. And when I travel at 48 states, I do stay at a lot of truck stops. And at the truck stop, what I do is I give you reviews of the truck stops, what's to eat around there, what people think about it. And a murder that occurred within, I tried to stay within 50 miles of that. So if this is something you enjoy to do, awesome. Also, thank you, return listeners. And on with the story today. And also, this does, well, there's nothing, it is just murder in this one. And it is technically unsolved, but a lot of people do believe they know who did it. So we're talking, um, well, let's go with the truck stop first. The truck stop is Rudders, number 87. It's in... Russell Hill Road, exit 78B. The address is 7311 Rochelle Hill R- Road. R- I say Rochelle, R I S H E L Hill Road, El Belfonte, Pennsylvania. So there you have it. As of, And as for their, um, their driver's, I can't talk. Trucker's path. I think I'm getting ahead of myself. I want to say one thing, but I'm already thinking of my next thing. Is it don't work out very well when I do that. If you've you're, uh, avid, you know, listen to a lot of my episodes, you realize that. But it says 70 spots. I'll talk more about that. It's don't have 70, more like 40 maybe. But as of 11 hours ago, it says Trucker's path is reporting drivers on Trucker's path. Is reporting there was many spots, but that was 11 hours ago. A lot could change. I said 70 spots, overnight parking scales, ATM. It's a decent place. There's a lot of these rudders in, you know, Pennsylvania area, like the Northeast. You run into a lot of these, kind of like the speedways in Indiana, where there's a lot of speedways. Some places have their stores, but there's a lot. I've saw a lot of rudders in the Pennsylvania area, so. And it's, I travel a lot by, I just like on 99, when I'm going to uh, wood mill that I go to up in Johnsonville, Pennsylvania, I, and I deliver south of, anywhere south of Pennsylvania, I'm going that way, I drive right by this place. So I'm not for sure if I spent the night there, I might have did a 30 minute break there. But then again, I could have, you know, I've stopped at so many truck stops, I don't know no more. And plus these rudders all look the same. So if you're driving by there and you say, well, let's stop there to get a bite to eat. Well, I try to stay within a quarter mile from the, the truck stop itself for different varieties. But unfortunately, there's only rudders there. There's not, nothing else to eat but besides what they have there. Now, they do have a decent restaurant there. You can order burger, hot dogs, and different things from there. And kind of like a quickie mark. I guess you quick stop if you're familiar with that. Kind of about the same... I, concept is um so but yeah there you go the convenience food is 2.5 so i don't know maybe they're not this place is not good i don't know but according to reviews are 2.5 out of 5 
So let's see what people think about this. A lot of people like this because it's a fairly new truck stop. And this one guy. Now keep in mind, I'm going to warn you right now, anything that's said on these reviews, it is not me, but other truck drivers who's been there and reviewed on here. That may or may not be happy. Like this guy, he's happy, but he, he his remarks are highly in question. He goes, typical rudders, mid-sized lot, big wide parking spots, spotless inside and out, good food, coffee, excellent, and Verizon signal. Here's where it gets questionable. No chimps, no china muzzles. You see any filthy animals throwing the trash in the rudders, handle it. Us real American truckers appreciate a nice, clean place to park. Oh, you can take that whatever you want, but Mr. Lex Kalinis is sounds pretty racist to me. You hear well, only one forty one spots left, five star, five star. Everybody likes a great place. It says no showers, very clean, well lit parking lot for to two. It says clean parking lot, restrooms, muck. Four star review. This place definitely don't have seven spots, but it is a clean place, which, like I said, is very new. And they do take care of these. There's some truck stops I've been to. we like a landfill. Great place. Clean. Nice. Here you go. Here, I was looking for this guy. An ominous user. You were talking about a lazy fuck. He says, nice place, but no entrance at the rear of the building for the truckers. We are forced to walk all the way around the building. <laughs> We need supplies. Okay, these buildings are not that big. If he's whining about walking an extra 100 foot, he probably did. did I bet you that is the asshole who would go to the Flying J, who even if he needs fuel or not, he's parking at the fuel aisle because he don't want to walk the extra 75 plus feet from his truck so someone else can use it. Then he goes in there, maybe take a shower, get something to eat, sit down, watch the news, while the whole time his truck is idling at the pump. I guarantee you, Mr. Anonymous or Mrs. Anonymous user who's complaining about walking around the place is that person. Let's find some other, because everything is five star in this place. I am looking for some negative stuff. One guy, three park in any, part three star any park in. One star just says terrible. All right, well, there is the truck stop. Now, like I said, the, the case I'm going to cover, it is unsolved technically but a lot of people really have really believe they know who did it and i'll get that in this story but all the evidence against this individual is all circumstantial and i believe they don't want to try to false charges on it because if they do you find out if found not guilty and acquitted well that's it they lost their one chance and there's no he could walk out that building with a big sign i did it and there's nothing they could do about it in fact, I just visited, which I was excited about. You go check out my TikTok channel, Sceneries and Cemeteries. I just visited the grave of Emmett Till, where the two individuals who did that to Emmett Till, right after they were acquitted, walked out and signed a big deal with a magazine or book. And in this interview, they admitted of killing Emmett Till. So once you're acquitted, that's it. So, but today we're talking about Elizabeth Ruth Arjma. People called her, she went by Betsy. So Betsy Arjma was the second of four children. She was born in Holland, Michigan on July 11th, 1947 to Esther and Richard Arjma. Raised in a middle class religious conservative household on West 7, 37th Street, Arjma's father was a sales tax auditor for Michigan State Treasurer while her mother was a housewife. As a child, Betsy Displayed a flair for art and poetry by adolescence. She had developed somewhat liberal ideas and displayed a concern for the underprivileged. Betsy attended H Holland High School and performed well academically, graduating with honors in 1965. Her time at Holland High School was a breeze, and she ended up graduating fifth in her class. As the end of her studies neared at Holland High, Betsy was conflicted on what she should do with her after high school. English, art, or biology were her strong subjects, and she often felt like she wanted to become a doctor. Also, with her 5 foot 8 inch frame, Betsy had long brown hair that had just a hint of red in it. There was never a shortage of boys following her. 
but for the most part, she was in, not interested in them. She knew college was a must, and she was a serious student when it came time for her studies and having a boyfriend at the time would not be a would be a distraction. While I smile with a, with a smile and a small talk, Betsy would pass on dates. The boys begged her, and her attention was now on the future at Hope College in the fall of 1965. The idea of becoming a doctor was not only what Betsy wanted, but her parents were also pushing for it. Betsy originally wanted to enroll in the University of Michigan Ann Arbor, but Hope College was where her parents graduated from, and the college was known for having a strong pre-med courses. So that's where she needed to be if she wanted to be a doctor. While Betsy was at Hope College, while Betsy was at Hope College, Betsy came out of her shell and ended up going on several dates. However, no one especially no one special ever crossed her path and she was never in a serious relationship while she attended Hope. For the most part, the young man Betsy went out with was very nice. But there's one man who became angry with Betsy after some form of disagreement, the man either pulled a knife on her or threatened her. But either way, Betsy, in the relationship, no charge was filed by Betsy, and the matter seemed to have dropped and never came back up. Just let it go. She says, stated, I run into assholes every day. Well, asses. So I imagine she said assholes. But then again, in the 60s, she meant asses. So she ran into donkeys. So no asses. Betsy told her friends who was attending Marquette, Marquette University in Wisconsin time passed too slowly for Betsy at Hope College and she often complained this place is not alive as it should be. Hope College as it was turning out was not living up to Betsy's expectations. She had more ambitions and interests that could not be fulfilled if she were to stay at Hope. Betsy was interested in the Peace Corps. She had a drive to help others who were in need. One way she would be able to pursue the Peace Corps was to transfer to the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor, where her the Corps had a heavy presence. So she transferred to Ann Arbor. By the fall of 1967, the United States was full-blown war with Vietnam, and the University of Michigan was a battlefield for student protests. The university had been a hotbed for anti-war politics and was the birthplace for the left-wing organization. Students for a Democratic Society and organization led by uh, B- Bill Ayers, Ayers, A-Y-E-R-S. So when Betsy arrived in Ann Arbor that fall, she decided to change majors. She no longer wanted to be a doctor. She enjoyed reading literature and poetry, so a change to the English department happened. Her drive to go into the medical field had dwindled. It was no longer what she wanted in life. Betsy also had another interest. She continued to that continued to grow. His name was David Wright. So there you go. Got him. Got herself a man. And pre med major. She enjoyed being around. By the time her senior year in college in sixty eight to sixty nine came about, Wright decided to transfer to Penn State Hershey Medical School, where I actually heard read in some. I forgot where I heard it from a book. I think it was. Or article where he actually won a scholarship to there. He was like the top 35. But either way, that's where he went. But although Betsy still wanted to join the Peace Corps, which would have required her to travel to Africa for a couple of years and around the world whenever needed, Wright made it known to her that he would not, he did not know what the future may lead in this relationship, that he might not be waiting for her. So, so a tough decision was made by Betsy. She had chose to be with Wright over the corp, core. So in the fall of 1969, Betsy continued on her way uh, with her studies as a graduate student at Penn State's main campus at University Park in a small town of State College, which was not too far from her boyfriend, David. While it was a s- tough decision Betsy made, here's where it gets kind of crazy. She could no longer pretend that she was not afraid of the recent killings that had taken place in Ann Arbor. And we're talking about John Norman Collins, which is someone I think I might cover sometime in the future, also known as the co-ed killer and not Ed Kemper. That's the first person when I told my wife about it. She said, I don't know Ed Kemper. Nope. 
this is not Ed Kemper, this is John Norman Collins, was a 22-year-old Eastern Michigan Univers University student studying elementary education. Collins began his killing spree in 1967 and resumed killing college women in March of 1969, around the same time Betsy was there. Getting out of Ann Armour was a must for Betsy, although she would miss her friends, but her family felt better now that she was in a safe distance from the killings. You know, thank God she was at a safe place where she is safe, Betsy's former brother-in-law said. And you know what they also say? Hindsight's always twenty twenty. So she resided on campus in the Arthurton Hall and shared her residence with a student named Sharon Brandt, who would later recall that Arsma seldom pursued extracurricular, extracurricular activities and spent much of her time either studying or at weekends traveling to Penn State Hershey to be in company with her boyfriend with David Wright. By Thanksgiving, on Thanksgiving, Arsma is known to have exhibited symptoms of stress due to the fact that she had fallen behind on English exams. She, she spent the day prior to Thanksgiving in the company of her boyfriend, his roommates, and their girlfriends before returning to her dormitory the following day. With intentions to meet her professor for advice on a research paper she needed to complete for her assignment. Wright drove Harsma to Betsy to the nearby bus stop in Harrisburg on the afternoon of November 27th. And that would be the last time he would ever see her again alive. At the time, Arjma had been in a relationship with Wright for approximately one year, and the two had discussed plans to become an engaged by Christmas. She had only been in the student of Penn State for just eight weeks at the time about what everything's about to unfold. So by the afternoon of November 28, 1969, Arjma and Brant left their residence to visit Penn State Pate Library. P-A-T-T-E-E, -E, Pate, library obtained research material for her English paper, en route to two-party company, having formed plans to reconvene later that afternoon to watch either Easy Rider or Take the Money and Run at the movie theater. That evening, approximately 4 p.m., at 4 p.m., Arjma spoke with one of her professors, Nicholas Jovinsky, to whom she stated her intentions to visit the stack building promising she would retrieve a book she used for reference on a project that was interested in. That interested in. However, first she had to meet with her other professor, Harrison Masrol. Due to a solid work ethnic, Jovinsky, Jovinsky, J-O-U-K-O-V-S-K-Y, I think it's Jokowski, Jokowski, okay. She had been one of, he said, stated, the professor said that she was one of her better students and which was a very challenging course. He had co-taught on British and American literature. She told him that she would bring him the book that she had used early for that day for the 60-minute class. Shortly after, she encountered two friends named Linda Marsha and Robert Steinberg. The three spoke for a few minutes, then went on their way. Betsy made her way to... Masrol's office, located at level one of the Pate Library. Masrol was busy with a bunch of meetings with students that day. She arrived on time and left after it was over. From there, she moved to level three, where she had placed her purse jacket and a book inside a corral assigned to her before walking towards a card catalog. Having found the reference, she sought. Arsma walked down there. Let me get say one thing about the way this library is set up. They go to level two, then you have books in level one and two, I believe. I know it two. I'm not, I haven't read anything about one, but since one was not relevant to the, they didn't really mention nothing about it. But it's two stories in the basement. The way they used to have it was that when they had the staff, I believe, that the students will go get their car, they'll bring it to the staff, and the staff will go down there. That's why it was very tight. Down there, it's about seven foot tall you know, aisles. And in duty's aisles, there was no lighting. Each aisle had their own light. So th there's just this very dim, really dark. So, but then I don't know if it's short staffed or what. They started allowing the students to go retrieve their own books. So she got her car to walk down a flight of stairs into level two core stacks, approximately about 4.30, at approximately 4.30 p.m. The final potential sighting of Arsma in level two core stacks 
occurred minutes after 4.30 p.m. when assistant supervisor named Dean Bernhardt observed a girl in a red dress stand alone in the aisle with two young men talking quietly among themselves in a nearby aisle closer to the west end of the core. Approximately 10 minutes later, another witness, Richard Allen, overheard a conversation between a male and a female in the general direction of where Arzma stood as he operated a coin-operated photocopier. Although Allen, actually that kind of amazed me. I didn't even think they had uh, like uh, copiers, photocopiers back in the 60s, but here you go. They had them. So although Allen could not hear what the two spoke, he informed police, nothing sound argumentative. Moments later, Allen heard a metallic crashing noise before a young man came you know, right by him, just, you know, described as looking like a student run by, barrel by, right past him. Unknown to anybody that Arzma had been stabbed a single time to the left breast with a knife while standing between rows 50 and 51. These wounds severed her pulmonary artery and pierced the right vertical ventricle of her heart. Following the stabbing, Arzma slumped on the ground close to the end of the aisle, pulling several books off the shelves as she fell onto her back. Two students, a foreign exchange student named Yufinda, Yufinda and Early, then served a man running from the direction Concealing his right hand, explained that girl needs help. Early described this man as being dressed in khaki, washable slacks, a tie, sports jacket. He had well kept brown hair, was approximately six foot in height and about 185 pounds, and may have been wearing glasses. The individual led Yufinda and Early into the core, where he pointed towards a prone body of Arsma laying between scattered books and metal shelves, which had also been knocked loose. As Early began to check for signs or a pulse, Yufinda observed the individual leaving the library. He discreetly followed the man upstairs where the individual ran out of the library. Yufinda attempted to chase this man but was outpaced. The individual was last seen running in the direction of the recreational hall. The police appeals all for this man or men who did this, you know, who the, spoke to the two, or at least spoke to the two men. They don't know if that's the person who did it quite yet but probably was, but they appeals to whoever this man was who spoke to these two men before fleeing the library to, library to come forward, but that was unsuccessful. Nobody ever came forward. So a Ufinda attempted to pursue the individual fleeing the library. Earlier, like I said, attempted to render first aid to Arzma, including mouth-to-mouth, and was soon joined by a group of bystanders, including a librarian. A call was placed to the campus hospital at 5.01 p.m., with responders initially formed, a girl was had fainted in the Pate Library. Two student paramedics was dispatched to the scene. Arriving minutes later, Arzma was quickly replaced on a gurney and moved from the library via a service elevator to be taken to the health center as a as the paramedics continued to perform CPR on her. The summoned ambulance tra- transferred Arzma to the lo- n- nearest health center. Although Osmo, Arzma was wearing a white turtleneck sweater at the time she was stabbed, the wound produced only a small amount of visible blood. However, Arzma was also wearing a red sleeveless dress over the sweater at the time of her murder, and the clothing she wore had been of thick material in the November climate, thus meaning the, the, you know, the single knife w- was within the single tear of the clothing was not immediately observed. She had also urinated where she fell. As results, these facts and non-medical individuals who discovered her body, plus a student first responder summoned to the scene to response to reports of a female student having fainted in the library, initially believed that she had indeed either fainted, experienced a seizure, or some non-critical medical alignment. Shortly after Arzma was transferred to the medical center, a senior medical individual, uh, somebody who knows what they're doing, not saying the other people, this was guy, he was the senior, observed blood seeping through the clothing at, as the two students, paramedics, continued to perform CPR and merely ordered the two to stop. Stop what you're doing. Her blood-soaked blouse and brow were cut off her body to reveal a single stab wound. Arzma was pronounced dead by physicians on November 28th at 5.19 p.m. So... Arzma's autopsy was conducted by Dr. Thomas Magnani at the 
Belfonte Hospital in Belfonte at 11 p.m. on November 28th. Concluded at 4 p.m. the following morning, Magna concluded Ajma had been killed by a single stab wound which had penetrated her breastbone, piercing her heart, and severing her pulmonary artery, causing extensive hemorrhaging into her chest cavity. Death had occurred within five minutes, and Ajma would have been able to scream for would would not have been able to scream for help as she essentially drowned in her own blood. Furthermore, she had not been subject to any f form of sexual assault or nothing. It was just a, a quick stab and whatever, and gone. Signs of potential hemorrhaging were also discovered on Arzma's chest, and minor signs of bruising and obstructions noted around her ear, more likely to be caused when she fell on the ground. Any time bruising everywhere. He also further opinion that his belief that Arzma murderer had initially aimed for the heart when he had stabbed her while facing her and that her assault assailant had a right was was a right handed individual. By the way, I forgot to mention that these aisles were so narrow that if two people actually been w was walking by it, one person had to go sideways or they both go sideways. That's how narrow these aisles were. So the Pennsylvania State Police assigned approximately 35 troopers to investigate Arzma's murder. These state police was assigned using, were assigned usage of the Buke building as a temporary command center as they conducted inquiries and of hundreds of students that were interviewed in the week following her death. The entire campus was unsuccessfully searched in the effort to locate the murder weapon and a $25,000 reward was offered for information leading to the arrest of Arzma's killer. Investigators would soon discover up to 400 individuals would typically enter and exit the Pate Library between 4.30 and 5 p.m. on a Friday, although on the date in question, only about 90 had done so. None of these interviews were considered viable suspects to people that was there. Two composite drawings of the individual, Yufinda and Early, had seen running from the direction of Arzma's stabbing were was created one with the assistance of Ufinda and a library desk clerk, one with Early, although only Early's image was released to media. Before police had been notified of Arzma's death, this is the, like I was saying earlier, the, tr the crime scene was compromised as the library staff believed Arzma had fainted or fallen and had ordered janitors to clean the urine from the tile floor of the aisle, fix the shelving, and restack the fallen books. As such, any physical evidence potentially left by the murder at the scene was destroyed or compromised. However, the first trooper to visit the crime scene ordered the area secured. A series of small, fresh blood droplets matching Arzma's blood type was recovered from the staircase leading to the level 3 core stacks, in indicating her murder had left the library via this route. Several, several factors in the circumstances surrounding Arzma's death led police to believe that she had likely known the murder as she had uh, you know eventually he eventually had been she'd been pro approached from the front by her assailant within a row too narrow for one individual to pass through unless one or two turned sideways had made no attempt to scream or flee exhaustive research and questioning also led police investigators to discuss any possibility she had been stalked and she had not been expected to be she had not been expected to be at Penn State that day but with her boyfriend but her boyfriend who was quickly eliminated from the inquiry. Moreover, although Arzma had recently had concerns about potential becoming a physician's wife and a mother while still young to one acquaintance, none of the entries in her diary or letter she regularly wrote to her boyfriend indicated that she had she felt reluctant about her relationship prospects with Wright. Interested in another suitor or had otherwise felt intimidated or uncomfortable during the eight weeks she had been enrolled in Penn State. Other theories investigated have included the possibility Arjuna may have stumbled upon this is what I think is funny. I guess this was like the the live the Sodom and Gomorrah of the sixties, the homosexual Sodom and Gomorrah of the sixties because a lot of people would go there because the situation was dark and so secluded. A lot of people would go there and do their deed. But yeah, she stumbled upon a homosexual encounter 
or a man engaged in a masturbation fantasies and had been murdered to assure her silence. This theory was given particular credit by investigators Michael Much, who speculated Arzma may have observed two men engaged in sexual behavior, and by keeping in mind 60s, that was not an acceptable thing as well, and had recognized one or both the men had been murdered to prevent them divulging, divulging to the others what she had seen. It would have ended their career, and they couldn't have that if that was the case. A few aisles from where Osmoral has been murdered in a section of the core used to store books, you know, store desks and spare shelvings. Investigators observed a desk with a seat pulled backwards. On top of the desk was a half-empty Coke can, soda can, a small pack of heterosexual and homosexual pornographic magazines, like a little jerk-off corner, some of which dated as recently as October, November of 69. Furthermore, there are two dozen pornographic, pornographic magazines were found concealed between books in the aisles where she had been murdered. And ample amount, just what I thought was crazy. I thought this, when I was listening to the book, Murder at the Stacks, I, when they mentioned this, I thought that, I don't know, I was, actually, they didn't say on the Murder Stacks was a podcast. They said there was, there was cum everywhere. They said ample amount of traces of semen was covered in multiple locations on the floor, shelves and walls. With one investigator later, co- you know, com- commenting trace, traces of semen was pr- protect, you know, it was everywhere. Discoveries led investigators to conclude, you know, it just included areas of sex was used to conduct illicit sexual encounters. Although partially fingerprints were obtained from the, the soda can, the prints did not match anybody in the police, you know, on database. All fingerprints upon and within the magazines were smudged and unusable. So, yeah, so I guess when you're dry, walking through the aisles and you decide you need to rub one out, okay, let's grab a book. Hey, there, there's a magazine right there. You're ready to go. But, yeah, there's come everywhere. So it's kind of like their homosexual getaway resort in the library. But other theories investigators consider were the possibility Arzma may have been murdered by a spurred suitor yeah, that she had rejected or had witnessed a drug deal and had been murdered to ensure her silence, or had been murdered due to an unsettled drug debt. However, Ozma did not smoke cigarettes and very occasionally drank alcohol. Acquaintances almost said that was she did not use drug at all. There's no way, so that's not it. Despite several leads or inquiries being pursued and hundreds of potential witnesses interviewed over the span of several years, no individual was arrested for her murder. So despite everything, the efforts of the, the Pennsylvania State Police and the President University, Eric Walker, who had conducted his own private investigation into Arsma's dead murder, the case gradually became cold, and the number of, investiga- the number of investigators assigned to the case dis- decreased, and potential leads to pursue became increasingly scarce. Arsma's murder remains unsolved, and it still does today. Record records per- pertaining to her murder remain sealed under the state's Open Records Act, so nobody could get to them. However, the Pennsylvania State Police are still actively seeking information on this case. Now, that's not where it's going to end. We do have some suspects where they did look at. We're going to go into them. But as for now, it is still un- considered unsolved. But I'm going to go with these individuals, who they think, and let me, I'd like to hear your opinion. The first person we're going to talk about is William Spencer. Spencer was a 40-year-old sculptor who relocated to Pennsylvania from Boston with his second wife shortly before Osma's murder. He had previously co-founded the Cafe Leon, Lena with his first wife in Saratoga Springs, New York in May of 1960 and recently relocated to Pennsylvania with his second wife again. Back to his second wife. Seems like I said it already, but there you go again. He relocated to Pennsylvania with his second wife. So he's moving around <laughs> in, obtaining empo- in obtaining employment, teaching a sculpture at a local college, at cult- uh, teaching sculpture at a local college as his wife studied for her Ph.D. Spencer was first reported to police to have a potential suspect in Arsman's murder after alleging confessing to have killed her as well in the library at Christmas, the 1969 gathering of uh, facility members. So he claimed he knew the person, also that he did it. These claims accumulated in his being formally questioned by investigators 
in the early 1970s, the year I was born. Look at there. According to Spencer, he and Arzma had been equated, and she agreed to pose nude for his sculptures classes to earn extra money, which none of her friends agreed to this. She would not have done anything like that. She was not prude, but she was not willing just to put herself out there like that. She was all about learning and going to college and getting her degree. Nothing like this was in her interest. So he had been in, he also had been level two horse act at the time of her murder and had seen her murder, whom he assisted had been wearing a overcoat. So he's probably naked in his mind. He offered to construct a busted individual he had seen for investigators, which he later provided to task force assembled to apprehend her murderer. So there you go. Get him, guys. This is what he looked like. But quickly, the quickly the police dismissed Spencer's claims as he and his wife had relocated to Pennsylvania just weeks prior to Arthur's murder, thus offering little time for the two to become acquainted. His claims he had been a new model had never corroborated, corroborated and r rapidly dismissed by investigators and acquaintances alike, as Arzma was known to be prudish, prudish, I don't know if well, I would say prudish woman, young woman, I don't know. Kind of like she was an Amish type girl, I shall not do that. I, furthermore, all new models at Spencer's class was known to have traveled to the university from Philadelphia, so they didn't even go to the school there, which is probably a good idea instead of the regular students you know, being new there, so it's almost get these pervs go there and shopping for potential dates. One student who initially arose, investigators arose, was suspicion, was a classmate, Arzma, named Larry Morer. Morer is known to have become acquainted with Arzma in the weeks before her death. On one occasion, taking her for a coffee, no ill feelings is known to have ever existed between the two, and Morer is known to have been cleared as a potential suspect in her murder, although it was unknown whether he actually passed or failed the polygraph test. However, Moore was a blonde in individual of average height and did not wear glasses, making his physical appearance markedly different from the one of the individuals had seen by the three eyewitnesses from whom they had been classmates and his running away from the level two stacked immediately after Osmond's stabbing. So he, he did not look like what they saw that was currently at the stack. It was not the person they seen. So let's get to our man of honor and the one person that a lot of people think have theories and the circumstantial evidence is pointing to. We're talking about, well, let's say author Derek Sherwood, investigator journalist David DeCock, D-E-K-O-K, have each published book focusing upon Arson's murder. Both murder strongly, both authors strongly believe Penn State professor Richard Charles Hefner, then a 25-year-old geology student at the university, was responsible for the death. And uh, not the other two guys, Murder or Spencer. They believe that he did it. He was a well-respected but socially awkward individual. Hefner is known to have taken extreme measures to obtain relationships with women to conceal his listeners homosexuality that his mama was not pleased with. So he was always trying to conceal his homosexuality by trying to get women to please mama. On one occasion in 1968, he was known to travel from Pennsylvania to Massachusetts to form a girl that he barely knew. He loved her. He had arrived and announced, uh, unannounced at her apartment to inform her of this fact only to su be surprised when she slammed the door in his face. Hefner resided across the courtyard from Ars mom at the Arthur Hall and at the time of her death was widely known for engaging in erotic behavior, including periodic bouts of explosive anger, and she the suspected thief of several specimens from the University of Rocks and Mineral Collections. He was also known to frankly dress in khaki trousers, and sports coat, and then to keep his brown hair short and tidy, his friendship with Arzma had been terminated by Betsy shortly before her death because she he was just a little bit way too creepy and obsessive over her. Hefner's first had come been mentioned to investigators days after Arzma's murder, 
when her roommate Sharon Brandt has suggested to police that Hefner may have been an may have may be an individual they should talk to with a relationship to the murder. According to Brandt, Hefner had visited their apartment on more than one occasion in the week prior to her murder. Hefner was questioned by investigators in early December of 1969. He freely admitted to having become acquainted with Arzma in late October, and the two occasionally socialized with her, you know, with each other. Although with approximately one week, she had terminated their budding, their friendship, saying that she wished to remain committed to David Wright. According to Hefner, he had been eaten an, an evening meal at a student's union building on the evening of November 28th when he first heard of the circulating rumors of a student being murdered at the Pate Library. And I'm probably saying that wrong name wrong, Pate, P-A-T-T-E-E, but I'm going to say it the whole time, so I'm going to continue saying it. <laughs> he had subsequently felt physically ill upon learning his former girlfriend had been the murder student. Hefner further claimed to have never set foot in the library, that he obtained re- research material from the Dickey building where literature related to geology was stored. The image created by Ufinda and a desk clerk never circulated the media bears a, a striking resemblance to Hefner. In addition, his studying schedule shows he spent two years following Arsma's murder afterwards, after it happened off campus. So he was really researching to see what was going on. Richard Hefner, let's talk about Richard Hefner, was called many things during his 50 years. He was a brilliant Dr. Hefner, assistant professor of geology, a renowned lecturer, lecturer with a doctorate from Penn State University, doctorate of Pennsylvania University. He was a defendant, but he was also a defendant in the high-profile 1976 molestation case, which ended in a hung jury and series of other criminal complaints, some petty, some serious. He was the plaintiff who spent a considerable portion of his final two decades in courtrooms filing lawsuit after lawsuit. Some intended to clear his name, others to attend his, you know, just intended to arrest his enemies. He was a terror, a neighbor who enraged those who lived near him in a 200 block of Nevin Street in Lancaster with his solidly ways and vindictive behavior but one thing Hefner who died in 2002 was never called a murderer and he never will because like I said everything's circumstantial no one no negative but let's talk about a little bit about Richard Hefner who was born in 1943 was a local bo- local boy made good a 1961 graduate of McCaskey High School and a 1965 Franklin and Marshall College alumni he worked on the staff of the North Museum before earning a doctoral degree in geology from Penn State. Many who knew him described him as a strikingly intelligent person. Hefner told investigators he found out about her death the evening of the 29th, November 29th, a day after she was stabbed. But in fact, Hefner knew of the crime shortly after it was committed. He showed up at home of a professor just hours after Arsma was killed, asking, have you seen the papers? The stabbing had not yet been reported to local newspapers, though, but he knew about it. But Hefner knew about it, of course, and expressed concern about what had happened to this young lady. By the mid 1970s, as police, you know, strangled, you know, struggled to find new leads, Richard Hefner's star was on the rise. They were never, they were still watching him. Assistant professor of geology at University of South Carolina. He was listed as, back then, who he was as who is who in America. In 1975 to 1976, he lectured at clubs and colleges throughout the eastern U.S. According to a 1975 article in the Intelligencer, 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 down there, I'm probably E-I-N-T-I-N-T-E-L-L-I-G-E-N-C-R. I guess I could have Googled that, but I'm already recording but Intelligencer Journal, and was on the cusp of even greater things. The University of the Southern California had offered him a teaching job and the position of a curator at the National History Museum of Los Angeles. And of course, this will come up. But Hefner, you know, there's other things that comes up why they did what they did. But Hefner's career was at a 
estimated academic crashed and burned when Mia Hefner's career as, as it was crashed and burned by on August 1975 when he was arrested and charged with involuntary deviant sexual intercourse with the corrupt immoral and corrupt morals of a 12 year old boy. Okay. Also, well, let's let's talk about this first. The boy was one of several who worked for Hefner in the Navin Street garage assembling rock boxes, shipments of rocks and murals Hefner sold to the Smithsonian Institute. Hefner vigilantly professed his innocence and lined up several prominent character witnesses for a week from January 27th to February 6th, 1976. The case was reported on the front page of the Lancaster newspaper. It ended in a hung jury, though Judge Anthony R. Appeal cited Hefner was contempt of court for blurting out that he passed a lie detector test after appeal had you know after they had ruled that it was inadmissible inadmissible to court. So Hefner was fined five hundred dollars and sentenced to a month in county prison. He served two weeks before the Pennsylvania court ordered him to release order him a release pending to appeal of the contempt situation. So that's what he got for the contempt. But he was released. Hefner won the appeal in March 1979. The state Supreme Court ruled that he could not be tried again because it would violate the constitutional protection against double jeopardy. Hefner's record was expunged and the state ruled in his favor. So after he that, he sued everybody he could declare his name. Hefner didn't lose all his lawsuits. He even won, nearly won 300000 after suing California's museum that had blamed he had planned on hiring him before the charges was filed, but of course he's acquitted, so he thought he was getting his job back. But one of the things I, I don't see how they paid because what I didn't mention was prior to going to college and whatnot, he was with the Boy Scouts and he had a lot of charges against him of assaulting these uh, scouts in a sexual manner, but they're always dropped. So, th but the charges was on the record, so I don't know. If, I think he actually got charged for it. I could not find really good evidence about that. I mean, I just do different podcasts and different, you know, in the books they talked about it, but I could not find anything solid that he did that. And plus, since he was acquitted on it, maybe that's what, maybe they saw something about that. That's why they didn't want him. So there were other incidents involving boys. In 1992, Hefner was arrested for interfering with the custody of a child after he took a 13-year-old boy, 13-year-old city boy to Chincatuga. Virginia and the boy's mother report you know he didn't tell his mom the boy's mother called to report the child missing the case was dropped after the mother said Hefner had taken the boy to Virginia on several previous occasions the youth was ultimately placed in the group home when Hefner came to visit he wasn't allowed to go in and he sued everybody and his grandmother because of that <laughs> said Christopher Upperhill of Hart Hartman Underhill and Burr Baker and Lancaster attorney who represented several defense in the case and faced off against Hefner in court at last three at least three cases so he was even representing himself in court I think he even said he didn't do a half bad job but I am not encouraging nobody to represent I always get legal advice 1994 police responded to an incident of Hefner's in the Street home and wound up charging him with the Aggravated assault, resistant arrest, assaulting a police officer, hindering apprehen apprehension, and disorderly conduct for allegedly fighting with officers and trying to keep him them out of his home. Also in 98, Hefner was convicted of assaulting a Delaware woman. Now it wasn't safe because I guess he was just his neighbors called the cops on him back like an asshole in 94. And I assaulted him or whatever, but yeah, he got uh, apprehended for that. Hefner was convicted also for selling a Delaware woman after an argument in the parking lot of a liquor world in Milltown, Delaware. The woman, according to court records, saw a dog in a shopping car and thought it had been abandoned. Hefner said the dog was his. The conflict escalated when the woman tried to walk away and get in her car. Hefner struck the car, struck the door with his vehicle, struck the let me start that again. Hefner struck the door of the vehicle with a bottle. I'm trying to get speed reading, but just take it easy, Gary. <laughs> she then tried to follow his vehicle and get his license, so he threw a bottle at the car. He tr he followed her to get license plate number according to court documents just when it es escalated. Hefner got out of his car, grabbed the woman by the neck, and pulled her out of the vehicle. I don't know if it was out the window or the door was open. 
and kicked and punched her, dislocating her jaw and loosening several teeth. And then Hefner would later file a solid lawsuit, lawsuit in federal court asserting that it was she who assaulted him. Of course, the case was thrown out and the judge saying the complaint burden on frivolousness. So, And then I don't know what came of that. I was still going to court, you know, appeals and delays and everything. But Richard Hefner died of a heart attack in the Mojave Desert in 2002 where he was studying rocks. Eight years later, and despite his cousin's regulations, police still wouldn't, you know, be, because his cousin's telling him about everything. But, oh, I forgot to mention that. You know, yes, I forgot to mention that. He was, his cousin was working there. It wasn't at my moats. I, f- I failed to put that out. But one time, while he was working in one of his garages, his cousin came over to talk to him, you know, help him do some stuff. When his mom came in, when the two boys were being sexually assaulted that worked with him and she got really argumentative about him and told him that what are you trying to do kill me like you did that girl what are you doing to me and he overheard that later on he would tell the police what he heard his mom saying you know kind of confessing I guess he did tell his mother that he had killed somebody but what like I said his mom did not know that his cousin was there so Richard's cousin was there so he heard everything of that conversation saying you killed that woman and now you're going to kill me what's with these two boys all this court he shouldn't have said in that manner but Hefner died of a heart attack because even though all that was said police still want to familiar identify him as a suspect he is not suspect state trooper Jeff Petrucci told the pre- everybody in this and he is a person who but he is a person we believe may have may have possibly had more information about the crime so they're not saying that he did it but he does know something he did know some i guess he don't know some because he's dead but he did know something leading to what happened more information about the crime arzma was laid to rest december 3rd 1969 her casket remained open through the ceremony prior to her interment she was buried in the arzma family plot within Pilgrim Home Cemetery in her hometown of Holland, Michigan, with a single rose from her boyfriend placed in her hand. The final letter Ajma wrote to her boyfriend, listen this, had arrived to his address the day after her murder. So the day she stopped, she went to sleep, but she used to write him a letter every day. And now his, her sister is actually writing him a letter every day. But he, I don't think, you know, the interviews in the different places I read, but he's not really comfortable about it. It always brings back the morning of losing her he never got over her he remarried and have a family of his own now but he would never really got over Arzma Betsy Arzma's murder also became a major factor in creation of university's police force at Penn State the years prior to her death had seen an increase in both violent crime sexual assault and recuse students protests you know radical you crazy protests at the university which had only a campus patrol to provide intimate law and order so they really have no power her death uh, optimized the need for increased public safety measures on the university campus and the university police force was established in early 1970s after the murder students and the facility on campus were impressive sharp said you know they were scared they were afraid the same thing was going to happen that happened to best would happen to them she said the young women were especially nervous and escort service was created so they would feel safe while traveling campus to campus. Sharp is a somebody that does involved in the school, and I don't remember where. But anyhow, you know, you know, also security cameras were installed in the library elevators, and anyone who needed to go to the second core level had to be escorted. Because of this, staff members tried to avoid the area. And the crazy thing about it is a lot of people really did not know. It became a myth, legend. A lot of the stories came crazy that the body wasn't found for much later. And, you know, it's like when the story just keeps growing and getting better and not better. It's worse, worse and worse as time progressed and everything adds. Before you know it, it's like a Freddy Krueger movie to happen in there. But, yeah, there's the story of Betty Arsmus. So, hopefully you like enjoy me telling of that story 
This is actually the third one I've been trying to do. This is the actual Wednesday episodes. I'm going to try to put it out. But I have been super busy. I'm still waiting for the Polinsky unit to call me back on my background check. But it's been since April 19th where I did an interview. So I'm beginning to just have no doubt. I might be just stuck here at Prima Express. I don't know. But what will help me to give me more time to, because they were four on and four off, so it gives me more time to work on the podcast. Where being a truck driver, I work 14 hours a day. gives me about an hour or two to research, get everything done. And then, like today, I was doing a recess, so I was able to record. So, but a lot of times, if my hours are the way the hours work, if I'm doing reset, now if I don't do reset, it just really makes it difficult to research and get really good content out there when you're very limited. But my wife Desra enjoys me telling the stories. As a matter of fact, she gets mad when I don't put episodes out. So I want to continue doing this, and that's my whole purpose. I might not have millions of followers or listeners or you know, as big as some of these other big podcasters, but I do enjoy what I'm doing. And like I said, then my wife enjoys it. So if I only have one listen a week and it's her, it is worth it to me. I will continue doing it until the day I die. So awesome. And if you like that, please write and review anywhere that you listen to your podcast. It doesn't matter where. Also, share with friends. Join me on my Facebook group, Truck Stomper and True Crime podcast or you could follow me on instagram true Cr- truck stomper and true crime twitter at truck murder also you could email me at truck stop murder at gmail.com if you also that's also my paypal or gary.howard5 at yahoo, yahoo.com you could go there either one would be good you can email me either one of them i monitor both of them and if you want to you know become a patreon i have not put no bonus episodes yet which i'm planning on doing and if you want to do that, you can Patreon at Truck Stop Murder and True Crime. There you go. And there's a story of Betsy R. Smith. I hope you like that. I hope you like the Monday murders. And stay tuned for Friday. It's recorded. I'm just going to have to release it. Okay, like I always say, you can't fix stupid, but you can sure numb it with the 2 by 4 Let's get out of here. <laughs> Thank uh-huh.